you know, there's a theme today, isn't there? We've seen that sort of enterprise and unified approach. So welcome, Andy. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you. And just to make sure you can see and hear me and see my screen. Can indeed spot on, Andy. Everything's working fantastically. So Good stuff. Thanks, for, thanks very much for that intro. OK, um, welcome, everybody. So I'm, I've got quite a lot to cover, so I'm going to get on with things. Today, we're going to give you a little bit of a, a, an introduction um, to for me to also set the scene with its architecture, because um, that is needed to really set the context of the actual demo that I'm going to show you. So just a very brief little bit of history. Um, there's only really two points I'm going to make on this. The first one is when we were founded back in 2010. Um, the company was started by former BMC, HP and ServiceNow product managers and developers. And the reason they started the company was that they were starting to see um, that there were potentially some gaps that needed addressing and they weren't really comfortable with the direction of the products. And so they decided that they wanted to start again with a new product um, that they would build from the ground up for the 21st century. The slide I won't bore you with because it does just sort of paint a, a brief picture of our history, but just bringing you right up to date, um, just where you see the accolades coming in. So the more recent ones perhaps being the most important. Serve you, um, we've got the certification there, as you can see, for 19 um, ITIL 4 practices. If you're not familiar with serve you, um, particularly in the UK, then it's very equivalent to pink and pink verify in the, uh, in the European countries. Um, we've also gained a lot of traction with the uh, uh, other analysts, including ISG and EMA, as you can read for yourselves. But uh, we were also um, the back end of last year awarded the uh, Gartner Peer Insights Award. Um, which is an award that uh, is based upon customer feedback. So we're obviously very pleased to have, have won that. So with all of that said, what I want to do is just introduce you to um, the architecture of 4Me, because it was very much rooted in the, the, the needs, as we saw them, of a modern enterprise service management system. And of course, um, the way that IT service management has grown up over the years, many of us have got a lot of experience with IT service management tools specifically and configuring those. And really what I'm representing here on this diagram is the IT domain and the top bubble represents the fact that we're providing services to our end users um, via uh, a self-service portal to allow them to come on uh, and get help and find information uh, relating to the services that IT were providing. But of course, in the world of enterprise service management, many of our customers um, may start their journey with IT, but very much want to have a tool that also supports the enterprise. And that, of course, allows the, um, the, the enterprise to use the same service management best practices that have kind of grown up in IT. So for example, the HR director um, has quickly realized that the success that the IT director has had uh, is something that they can follow because at the end of the day, HR of course are themselves just simply providing services to the enterprise employees. And they obviously want a way of being able to offer self-service as well in the same way that IT is, so that they can uh, publish their services and publish knowledge and standard requests that the, the enterprise employees can make against those services. And of course, allow the tracking of requests against certain commitments, which we all know in uh, IT terms as, as SLAs, of course. And of course, what's happened over the years is many different areas of the enterprise, including facilities, uh, finance, legal, security, um, and even the catering services within our environment have quickly realized that they're actually dealing with calls, issues, requests from information from the employees of the enterprise and that they are all in their, in their own way providing services to the enterprise. 
And so they've all realized that they can capitalize on this service management framework, which is grown up with best practices like ITIL, um, and that they can uh, publish their services and use that single central portal um, as a way of allowing their customers, if you like, the enterprise employees to access their services. So the reason for showing you this is this is exactly the architecture that we built within For Me. So the top bubble here, we call a directory account. Um, and it kind of fulfills two functions. One is it contains all of the master data that is common across all of these different domains, as we call them. Um, so if you think about it, um, the data that we have against our uh, employees, our um, organizational structure, and indeed the geographical makeup of our enterprise, that data can be common across all of these different support domains. Because for example, it's the same people that we're providing IT services, HR services, facilities, etc. And it's the same people that want to come onto our portal to make requests against services within these different domains. So this directory account contains that common master data. It also provides a single central self-service portal that our enterprise employees can come to get help, no matter what they need help with, whether it be IT and HR query or a broken desk for facilities, for example. Um, now, what this architecture has given us is the directory account that we've already talked about. And these bubbles here representing the different support domains, we call support domain accounts. So what these allow us to do is an employee can submit a request. In this case, maybe it's against the payroll service. And as you can imagine, that request could contain private and maybe sensitive information. So these different um, support domain accounts allow us to segregate that data to ensure that only the people that need to see that request can in fact see it. What we can also do in each of these support domain accounts, so this example being HR, is that HR can define the services. So in other words, define the service catalog that they're offering to employees and make that visible in the central self-service portal up here. And they can also build this support domain for their purposes. So for example, they can define knowledge articles, standard request templates for each of their services, for example, so that employees can come on and click on those standard requests, the standard things that they can ask for um, and get those requests fulfilled, which of course also implies the need for workflow. So likewise, they can build their own workflows here. They can even build automation and integrations as they need to as well. So fine, segregation using this architecture is fine, but of course, these support domains may also need to collaborate. So that's why we've drawn these lines here, which we refer to as trusts, to allow these um, different domains, these different accounts, to be able to interact. And in the demo, I'm gonna show you an offboarding um, request and workflow which is a good example of a workflow that might span multiple support domains because we need to remove people from payroll, but we also need to remove access to IT systems, collect IT assets like phones and uh, uh, laptops, et cetera, for, for the person that's leaving, um, and maybe remove access to office areas and so forth and revoke badge access. So, We'll have a look at an example of, of how that actually works in the demo later. But also, of course, this idea of accounts and trusts also can extend to our external service providers. So in this case, the printer bubble down here, this could represent Canon who um, use for me to provide their print services to many different uh, customer organizations. So my organization, which we've represented here with this account structure, let's call them Widget International because that's the, uh, the name of the company that we use in our demo environment, which you're gonna see sight of very shortly. So 
uh, Canon can provide their services to widgets and to other customers by simply um, in their forming instance, they can define an SLA for one of their services. So let's say they provide uh, the, this print service that we're talking about. They specify widgets as the customer. Um, we establish a trust between the two accounts, which is a 10 second job for me to enable. And that makes the SLA visible to widget and they can then use those services as they see fit. So they can set the coverage, as we call it, for that service to decide who we're going to provide that service to. So they can set the coverage to be customer facing so that we provide those services to specific departments or people at different uh, specific sites, for example. Or we could use the um, services to underpin services that we're providing to our end users. So this publishing of the SLA and the trust also immediately allows me to pass things like requests and tasks to Canon as a service provider. So this is, of course, representative of a, a truly multi tenanted environment. And of course, even our other domains like HR, for example, um, um, may outsource selectively uh, some of their services in the same way that uh, IT does to SAP, maybe a network service provider and Canon for print services. HR often outsource relocation services and uh, payroll, for example. So what this architecture allows us to do, of course, is that we can submit our request against payroll. That can be assigned out to uh, the external service provider if necessary. So that's the provider that supports payroll. But of course, maybe the issue turns out to be IT related. So we need to be able to, where necessary, reroute it back and even out to one of the IT service providers. And of course, what we want to be able to do is track the end-to-end -end service provision um, in the same way for both internal and external service providers. So this is the architecture um, that we've built um, within Formi to make this happen. And there are many advantages to this um, multi-tenant uh, architecture. One of course is collaboration because anytime an organization with Formi wants to collaborate with others, it's simply about enabling a trust, that 10 second job. And because we have standardized on the very core processes and the way that things like requests are passed, then we can freely pass requests across the trust to a service provider without the need to do it the way it's often done um, today. Um, even if uh, a customer and their supplier are on the same tool, often they've been configured uh, in each of those different instances to require us to build an integration to do the process and data mappings. So that is a thing of the past with this type of um, um, uh, infrastructure. But also we do uh, a weekly release uh, within Formi. So all of our customers who are on Formi are all on the same latest version. So we also eradicate the need for um, upgrades as well. This slide just gives you a sense of the functionality that we have, and uh, we have a very flexible licensing model. So it's purely user based, but when you have a license, it gives that person access to everything within for me. So as you can see here, I'm not going to spend time going through these individually. We will explore some of these as we go through the demo. But as you can see, um, as well as being able to provide enterprise service management core capability, we also have um, the sort of typical IT service management functionality, which um, allows us to have very, very cohesive processes within that particular area. All right, enough of the slides. Let's get into the demo. So we're going to start with the self-service side of things. So you'll notice that I'm showing um, the self-service portal on the left and I'm showing you the um, 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 
phone on the right, which is uh, using, we're going to show you the, uh, the native app. So I'm logged in as Dutch Collins, as you can see. On the right, I'm signed in here as Gene Aiken, who happens to be the manager of Dutch Collins. So in the scenario we're going to play, Dutch Collins is, has got somebody who's leaving the business. So we're going to register an offboarding request to trigger a workflow. Gene on his phone over here is going to approve that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move to what we call the specialist UI. So that is where our support folks and our service desk staff uh, access for me to actually do the doing, as it were, within um, the support activities. Access to the specialist UI does require a license, but everything I'm going to show you here is basically free of charge. You do not need a license. So let's just have a quick look at what we see. There's a couple of widgets here, broadcasts and inbox, which are only displayed if there are items to show. Broadcasts will show me information, but only about the services that Dutch Collins is covered for. So we're never presenting information that's irrelevant to Dutch. Here, we're also showing the inbox, which is giving us one way of telling our end users um, when they need to do something. So here, there's a, um, an incident that uh, has come back. We've, we've uh, uh, Dutch has uh, previously registered this issue with email, but Howard in the operations team has come back to ask for more information. We also see an approval here, if I click on it. Um, this is for a change that we have in the environment. And I see a change summary here. If I click on the PDF, it will give me a change summary and I can decide whether I'm going to approve that or not. And finally, the last item you see there in the inbox is a project task. So people can act on their project tasks as well. And again, this is all free of charge. Don't need a license for all of this. We could also search. Um, we can use our virtual agent or this global search, but let's get on with our scenario. I'm just going to use the old fashioned way of requesting something and you'll immediately see that Widget International are using the self-service portal to allow end users to get help, not only on IT, but also HR facilities and data protection, which is our security team. And if I click on IT, for example, we will see the services that uh, I, uh, as Dutch Collins, am um, actually covered for, and only those that I'm covered for. So for example, I could click personal computing. If I need a new PC set up for um, a new starter, I can see here that we've got standard things that I can ask for against personal computing, as well as knowledge articles. If I click this option here, I get a form that allows me to specify all of the details for my new person. And of course, building these forms and also the workflows that may be triggered, an example of which I'm going to show you later, um, these are all um, buildable in our uh, UI within the user interface by an admin. So you don't need development skills or anything to build these things. So coming back to the top level, let's get on with our little scenario. So I'm going to um, follow up on this request to offboard a member of my team. So I'm going to click on request something. And I'm going to click on this time human resources because this relates to offboarding, which is a service, as you can see, these are the services that I'm covered for by the HR department. So all of the HR, uh, typical HR services I see here, including offboarding, and here I should see a standard offboarding request. So what I can do is I can click on that item and that will give me a standard form to specify from the drop down here who is leaving. So let's say Adam is leaving. When is he leaving? And when's the final date when he needs to be totally offboarded and removed from our systems and no longer has access to any of our facilities? So as soon as I click submit, the workflow is going to be generated in the background and you'll start to see um, some things happening on my phone as Gene gets some push notifications here. And one of those relates to this very workflow that we've kicked off. And it's a notification to let him know he's got an approval to turn his attention to. If I was quick enough, I could have clicked on the notification, but let's just go into the native app here. So. Here I can see uh, my requests, for example. I can also see 
my uh, inbox. So here are my uh, particular assignments. So you can see that uh, Gene is a manager. So he has things like project tasks and approvals. But of course, even our support staff um, can use this to keep track of their inbox and their assignments while they're on the go. So if they need to deal with incidents or change tasks, for example, then those IT folks perhaps can deal with those from their inbox. But I'm going to go to my notifications um, because, of course, um, that's where we saw the notification about the offboarding and the approval I need to give. So if I click on that, we see the approval. We've got all of the information here relating to the uh, offboarding request. And I'm just going to click the thumbs up to approve that. Um, and of course, that has now happened. So, so much for self-service. Let's now move our attention to the specialist UI. So bear in mind what we talked about earlier and those different support domains and the fact that offboarding um, would cover multiple support domains. So I'm going to move to a separate tab here and let's expand um, the view here. And I'm going to sign in to the uh, HR support domain um, in my environment as Howard Tanner. And when I sign in here, um, oops, I logged into the wrong environment. Bear with me. Here we go. We're going to log into the actual HR support domain as James. And when we do so, you'll see that we come straight into the inbox console. So top left, you see the different consoles we can access. We always default to the inbox here. I can see I have five new assignments denoted by the blue dot and the red five. And this is where James and his HR and payroll colleagues work. So this is their support domain. And we're using the specialist user interface to access that support domain. Now on my inbox, I see in next target order, all of the stuff that I need to uh, deal with, including this task here, which is um, related to, if I click on the workflow, I can see here, this is a task that relates to the workflow that we uh, had generated here. And if I click on um, the uh, Gantt view here, I see the entire workflow. And I can also see activities for facilities management and the IT operations team here. So as well as being able to work on this activity, what I can do if I go to the, my next tab here, we're going to sign into the IT support domain. So it's the IT support teams all work within here. And again, you see their inbox. But if I go down here, I can see a task which relates to the same workflow. So I can click on the workflow to see that it is the very same workflow that we were just talking about. But also, um, if I just come back to this view, we can see here that if I click on the original request, we will get a restricted view of the details submitted. So any HR sensitive information which is internal to that HR domain, we will not see. So that's how we achieve the segregation and collaboration across the different domains. Now, one of the other things that we're going to do is, um, um, for example, we have here the uh, service desk console. So very quickly, I'm going to show logging a call for Matt Leach. And let's say that he has uh, an issue with receiving email. And I'm going to log that immediately against one of the services that he's covered for, which is what we're showing here. None of these standard requests seem to fit the bill. So I'm going to click none of the above. And you can see I only need to specify minimal information as a service desk analyst. And Forming is going to route it to the team that support this specific instance of the email service because we know a lot about Matt and where he works. And not only if I save this, will it track the SLA relating to email provided to the business, but what I can also do here is I can um, look at what this depends upon. And as I go down the hierarchy here, you'll see that it depends on a network service as well. So as I look at, look at this incident, I could decide it's a network issue. 
So if I drag and drop that service instance, it automatically uh, assigns it to the external team at GlobalNet, which you'll remember um, on my diagram, we can connect to an external provider via a trust. And I can put in here, looks like a network issue. And if I then save it, I just need to fill in the, uh, the mandatory fields. But now I can go to the global net who have a total, totally separate instance of their own, log in as Frederick Anderson, and I will immediately see that incident that we were just talking about. Here it is. And I can even see that Howard is still viewing this record in his instance. So it's very much as if we're all working within one system. And what I'm going to do is just quickly resolve this particular issue. Um, I'm going to drag and drop um, an item here. The, this is the offending LAN card. So I'm going to say reset card service is up. And I can complete this and you'll see a message saying it's going to be returned to the widget account. And if I save that, uh, add all of the custom fields I need, then it's going to go back to Howard. Um, and if I come back to Howard's view, I can see also the live update and I can even see Frederick Anderson is still viewing this. Okay. So we're very much against time here. So one of the things that uh, we also have available is analytics. So in the analytics, I can actually show how well GlobalNet were providing against the SLAs and GlobalNet see the exact same information because we've got this concept of uh, a single version of the truth uh, with uh, reporting. So I think I'm up against time, so I'm going to hand it back for now. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. And uh, do get in contact if you want to see a little bit more for me, perhaps less rushed uh, and spending a little bit more time on some of the shift left capabilities that we have. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, nice uh, detailed um, demo there. Thank you. You're right, though. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for for questions, but I think you'll be joining us um, a little bit later on as well. So, yeah, we'll have some chance to listen to some more questions, hopefully then. So thank you very much indeed, Andy, and we're going to move on. So, again, let's welcome our next speaker, who is uh, Stephen Oram, Team Lead Growth Sales at CISAID. And Stephen will be discussing service automation 